Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, The Son can do nothing of himself, but what he seeth the Father do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Father, doeth the Son likewise. For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raises up the dead, and quickeneth them, even so the Son quickeneth whom he will. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He that honoreth not the Son honoreth not the Father which hath sent him. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is, when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God, and they that hear shall live. For as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given to the Son to have life in himself." And hath given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. Marvel not at this, for the hour is coming, in the which all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth, they that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil under the resurrection of damnation. I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because... I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which hath sent me. If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There is another that beareth witness of me, and I know the witness which he witnesseth of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. But I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He was a burning and a shining light. And you were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. But I have a greater witness than that of John. For the works which the Father hath given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father hath sent me. And the Father himself which hath sent me hath borne witness of me. Ye have neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape, and ye have not, and ye have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent, him ye believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think that ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. And ye will not come to me that ye might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, but him ye will receive. How can ye believe which receive honor one of another, and seek not the honor that cometh from God only? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. For had ye believed Moses, ye would have believed me, for he wrote of me. But if ye believe not his writings, how shall ye believe my words? Long passage this morning, but a lot there to uh, unpack for us. So as we look to God's word, let's have a word of prayer together. Lord, we just uh, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth in it. We thank you for our young people here at this church, and we pray that you would fill their minds with your truth today in the classes that they're in. And Lord, help our hearts to be yielded to your truth as well. Allow it to be explained clearly and help us to find application in it for our own lives. We thank you that it, as you've promised, it will not return void, and we pray that would be true for us here today. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, I've got a message I've titled, uh, we kind of picked, uh, we kind of picked uh, a passage that continues from about two weeks ago through our journey through John, and um, we're picking back up on this story with the man who was healed on the Sabbath, and this is the aftermath of it. We continue with um, really quite a long, um, long discourse from Jesus uh, as a result of the persecution that he got from um, from the Jews because he was healing this man on the Sabbath day. And, um, you know, uh, the message I've titled this morning is Work, Witnesses, and Wonder. 
because there's a lot to, to talk about in this passage, but really it boils down to this, and I just want you to think about this illustration for a moment. You know, many of you, like myself, have been to doctors over the, over the years, some, some more than we would like to have gone to. Uh, mo- probably all of us have gone to more than we'd like to have gone to, but uh, doctors are there for a reason, and you know, I always say, say that... Um, I'm happy that, that God has people who are trained in medicine and we continue to improve in our, in our ability to fight disease and to treat things that you just couldn't even think of years ago. Uh, and God uses medicine to heal people. God uses people with you know, these, these types of training to, uh, to help us. And even though he's the great physician, he often works through physicians. And uh, we need to recognize that. So I always say, however... You know, not every doctor that graduates from medical school got an A. You ever think about that? You think, okay, you go through college, every one of us, you know, you go through college, you get your degrees. Not everybody always makes it through with 4.0, right? They don't all get, you know, some, there's always a weak class. And, and, you know, that's true with doctors as well. You know, there's A students, there's B students, C students, D students, and friends, right? <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, that's why I always say, you've got to make <laughs> you've got to make sure that you're your own advocate, right? You go into the doctor's office, and we respect what they do, and we, you know, we're glad for their training, but you've got to be an advocate for yourself. You've got to ask the right questions. You've got to really do your research. And you know, there's so much today, it didn't used to be around for us, but today, if you say, you know, I need a, I need a, I need a knee, knee fixed, right? And I'm, I'm always dealing with my knee or my ankle or something. I go to the doctor for that all the time. And if I said I want to go get my knee fixed, you know, I can go on Google now or whatever it is, and I can, I can look up, okay, who's the best knee doctor, right? And he, oh, here's this guy, he's here in Pittsburgh, and this guy, he does this. And so you can look it up, and you can see all their credentials. Well, they, they went through this medical school, and this was prestigious, and blah, 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 and they got these awards, or they've done this research, or whatever. And you can, you can know a whole profile about whatever doctor it is you're thinking about going to before you even set the appointment up, right? You can go and figure that out. You can go, I go to the doctor's office for my, um, for my knee. I have, a, I have a knee issue that I deal with. And I go into the doctor's office and you sit in the waiting room and you look around the waiting room on the walls and what do you see? Degrees. Here's the degree of this doctor. There's the degree of that doctor. And it's all these different medical schools that they went to and all the different maybe uh, journals that they've written in. And they have them all like what? Framed on the wall. These are their credentials, right? That they've posted for you to identify them as credible, capable, and just, you know, really, you know, able to do the job type doctors. Right? And, and, you, and some of us say, well, that's good enough for me. And they go in and they get their treatment and that's good. And then some of us say, I need more than just to know he's got the degree on the wall. So what do we do? Hey, I need, a, I need my wrist operated. I know a lot of people here have used the same doctor around. Have you, have you gotten your, you, I need just a carpal tunnel surgery. Nobody that does that. Oh, yeah. So-and-so. Dr. So-and-so, he did mine and he did a great job. Then you find out somebody, oh, so-and-so did this. He's a, he's a good doctor. He's really done well for me. And then sometimes you say, you know, have you ever gotten this doctor? And you're like, oh, don't, don't, get, don't get that doctor. You know, <laughs> stay away from him. <laughs> right? So what do we do? We have witnesses, right? We look for witnesses to tell us something about the quality of care that I get from a given doctor. So we look at their credentials, and we look at their witnesses, that, that people that we know. All these things help to inform us as to whether this is a doctor that we trust, that we believe in, that we really want to in, allow to, you know, go under the knife with or whatever it is. You know, we have to really be thinking through those things. These are important for us because they're consequential, right? If the doctor messes it up. Sometimes you can be messed up for a long time. So there's a lot of consequences involved. Well, this is exactly the situation that Jesus is bringing to the Jewish people who were persecuting him at this time. They had, they had looked at Jesus and they said, you are not credible. You have no degree. You have no ability to do the things that you say you do. And the law that we have, which is you don't work on the Sabbath, you just broke. I don't care whether that guy who was 
lame for 38 years got up and walked. It doesn't matter to us. The fact is, you broke this little law that we have that, as we've talked about before, it wasn't really from the law of God. It was something that a man-made law that they had come up with. And so they were accusing him of not being credible, of having no ability to, to really uh, to have authority in this area. And they were, they were persecuting him, it says, here in verse starting in verse 17, 16 and 17. And so what does Jesus do as an answer to them? He brings out two things specifically. First of all, his work, and second of all, his witnesses, to explain to them why it is he is capable to have authority in this area. And so we're going to just look at these verses little by little and to kind of unpack, first of all, what... What was the work that Jesus tried to explain as an answer to the accusations that, uh, that, he, that, they, that he was doing? See, these accusers, they were unaware of the work that he was capable of doing or the work that he was destined to do. All they had done, they had seen him heal this man, and they, they needed to understand that Jesus' work, first of all, was completely empowered and in complete agreement with God the Father. Because God the Father, they knew. He was the God of the Old Testament. He was Jehovah Jireh. He was all of these things. He was Yahweh. We talk about the God of the Old Testament. This was who the Jews revered. But who this son was, who Jesus was, standing in front of him in flesh and blood, they didn't revere him. And so Jesus said, the first thing you need to understand, that my work is on the same level as my father, who is God, God himself, the God that you do revere. So verses 17 says, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. And it says in the end of verse 18, he said it, they said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. Now we may have read that and we said, well, what's he talking about? He seems vague. There was no question in the people's minds that he was talking to that he was making himself equal with God in the statement. He had a unique lineage from God. He was claiming that. He was claiming equality with God the Father. So when you think about the Son of God, sometimes we think, well, he's like the lesser of the two, right? The Son's always lesser than the Father. But he's not saying that. When we think about, we need to think about God in terms of three persons, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. God the Son, he says, I am equal with God the Father. That was his claim. He was we call him the Son of God, it's not, but it's not just a generic term. In fact, he says, I share in the unique work of God himself. That's what he says. My Father, God has worked from the beginning, and I have as well. When we look, go back to John 1.1, 1, 1, you go back to Genesis 1.1, 1, 1, Jesus Christ was there active even at the beginning of creation itself. Jesus Christ was, was doing things then. His work has been from the beginning as well. He is... The Bible says he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's who Jesus Christ is, in the same way that God the Father is. So he shares this unique word with claiming that just as God had been at work until now, he has been at work as well. And he was putting his own work on par with the very work of God the Father. So the first thing that he had to claim about himself was he is God. It's something that they didn't recognize about him. And then what does he say further about his work? Verses uh, 20 and 21, he says, The Father loveth the Son, showeth him all things that himself doeth. He will show him greater works than these, that ye may marvel. For as the Father raised up the dead and quickeneth him, that's made them alive, even so the Son quickeneth, or makes alive, whom he will. So he says, you don't have to just take my word for it. He says, you don't have to just you know, believe this claim, this credential that I'm putting out here, that I am God, my God, him, God in the flesh. He says, you have to recognize there are works that you can see in, in, in me and through me that are only possible because of the power of God that flows in me. He, he, was, he was the one and only person that had the unique power of God. He claimed that this power was the power of God. He, he had just healed this lame man that had been laying by the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. And you think, man, that's a great feat. That's a wonderful thing. You know, he, 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 and he was going to do lots of other things as well. But he says, you don't understand. <laughs> that's nothing.
child's play. He says, you're going to see much greater things than this, and you're going to marvel at them. That's what he says. Because he says, I can make alive and quickeneth whom I will. God's the only one that can raise people from the dead. I mean, nobody else has ever even claimed or tried to do it from, from my perspective. Jesus now was predicting in advance that not only God was the only one that could do it, but you were going to see him begin to do it as well. And throughout his ministry, we see that happen, right? We see him raise Lazarus from the dead. And we see him call, them, call him up from the dead. And eventually, after he died on the cross, we see Jesus rise himself from the dead. He had power over the death in his own self. And he also, as he's promised us in Scripture, says that all who believe in him will have power over death as well. We can look forward to a resurrection when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. Because, what does he say? The claim is, the Son quickeneth whom he will. The Son is able to make us alive. So what does he say further about his work? He has the power of God. He makes himself equal with God. Verses 22 says, The Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment unto the Son, that all men should honor the Son. The third idea behind his work that he's trying to explain is that he passes out God's judgment. Now this is, maybe sounds like a, a real doomsday type thing. You know, we were just talking about how he's going to make us alive. He's going to keep, make people walk that couldn't walk before. He's going to do these great and mighty things. And then he says, but you know, I'm also a God of judgment. This is a God of discernment. And, and God the Father has given him and committed unto him the judgment of the world. He's the righteous judge of all creation. And the Bible says one day, every person will stand before Jesus Christ. And we will have revealed before us what it is that we've placed our faith in, what it is that we've done with the faith that we've been given, what it is that we've done to cultivate and mature ourselves in the Christian life. And Jesus says there's not going to be any hiding behind the bushes in this. <laughs> it's going to be exposed. Every little moment of our lives will be laid wide open, and he will judge us righteously. The first thing he will judge us, though, in is where we've placed our faith and our trust. Because the Bible says, no other foundation can they lay but that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Yes, you can do great things, you can have great works, but the fact is, if you don't have faith in Jesus Christ, if you haven't accepted the fact that he died for your sins, and that when he rose again from the grave that day, he did it for you, so that you could have power over death and sin. If you haven't trusted in him by grace through faith, and accepted him as your savior, you're going to be, the Bible says, condemned already. <laughs> he won't even need to spend much time judging you because the faith is not there to begin with. You have to have your foundation in Christ. He judges those who will be the recipients of, ter of eternal life. And you know, it's funny, he's talking about judgment and the judgment that's entrusted to him, and he's speaking to this group of Jewish accusers of him. <laughs> and what were they doing? They were judging him, right? Here was a group of people who were saying, Jesus, we're judging you and what you're doing here on the Sabbath and how you're going about your ministry. We have a real problem. We're casting some judgment and accusing you of doing the wrong thing. They were standing before the righteous judge and trying to judge him. And what does he reply? He says, you've got it wrong. One day I'm the one that will be judging each one of you. So let's continue. We've got a lot of passage to go yet. Verse 24. He continues with the, uh, the works that he's talking about. And he says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly. He says, I say unto you, who, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. He dispenses the life of God. This life is only for those that have believed in Jesus as their Savior, as we've already talked about. And he says he will judge. He will know whether that is true or not. The Bible talks about us as a church, as a group.
I'm a Christian. You know, you ask someone, yeah, I'm a, I'm a believer. I, I trust in Christ. I know him. And I, and I go to church and, and I give my tithe and I, I do the right thing. And you know what? I, I, I accept that on face value. Someone comes and tells me, I, I'm, I profess to know the Lord as my Savior. What do I say? I'm, I'm, glad to, I'm glad you're part of the family of God. I'm glad that I can call you a brother or sister in Christ. I don't know whether you've truly trusted in him as your Savior. We can all say things and act ways and put up the facade and put on the Christian mask today and be what it is that we think others want to see in us. And we can even deceive ourselves with that. But the fact of the matter we've said or had people believe through our life. Life to those that have truly put their faith in Him. He says, but if that's not enough for you, <laughs> we start in verse 31. He says, I've also got some I want to talk about. I've got some things that other than just what I'm You see in verse 30. He's, well, verse 31. He says, if I bear witness of myself, my witness about myself, but instead of letting me tell you about what he says, there's another that beareth witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. Ye sent unto John, and he bear witness unto the truth. Now, of course, he's referring to John the Baptist. John the Baptist was a forerunner of Christ, right? The Bible says he was preparing a way making the way straight for the Messiah which was to come. Jesus was the great Redeemer that had been anticipated and prophesied about all through the Old Testament. And here was John the Baptist. We see, we see the beginning of the Gospels and we see as a voice crying in the wilderness. Here he is, make way, the, the, make straight the paths for the Lord. He's saying Christ is coming. And what does he do? He begins to baptize. He becomes very popular with the people. Even though he's out in the wilderness doing his thing, he's telling people to repent from their sins. He doesn't have a popular message, but yet he has a message that hits home. People realize John has some truth here. Many people were baptized and affected by his ministry. And what does, what does, uh, what does the people even think about John the Baptist? He was very revered. Even in Jesus' day, he was this great prophet, this great teacher. A lot of people came to believe in John the Baptist. He was a very credible witness. So Jesus brings him up. He says, it's John the Baptist that bear witness unto the truth of who I am. He says, these things I say, he says, I receive not testimony from man, but these things I say that ye might be saved. He says he doesn't really even need the witness of John the Baptist. He only brought him up as an example because he knew the people revered John, but ultimately they needed to have their belief in him. He was the witness. Verse 36, he says, I have greater witness than of John, for the works which the Father given me to finish, the same works that I do, they bear witness of me. He says, my miracles are witnesses of what I am and who I am. This was not taking someone else's word for it. Seeing is believing. He says, every time you see me do something that no one else can do, it should be a sign to you <laughs> that I'm not just an ordinary prophet here. I'm not just an ordinary guy who has something, you know, help to, to help you with, with some self-help advice. You know, he's no, I've got, I've got something greater than this. And my works, my miracles are my witness. And then I think this is, uh, he goes on with, a, with it further, and he says in verse 38, 39, 
He says, You have not his word abiding in you. For whom he hath sent ye believe not. Search the scriptures. For in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. He says, if you don't believe John the Baptist, and you can't look at the miracles that I'm doing and recognize that I really am God in the flesh, he says, go read your Bible. <laughs> go read your Bible. You Jews who like to talk about knowing the Bible so well, who have all this Old Testament memorized, you know that the Pharisees, who were like the ruling, the ruling group of the Jews at this time, in order to become a Pharisee, they had to memorize some serious scripture. <laughs> in, order, in order to become a Pharisee, you know, we think, oh, I, I, learned a, I learned a Bible verse this week. Or I learned a Bible verse once every week. You know what the Pharisees had to memorize? The entire book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Five books of the Bible they had to memorize without looking at no, no helps, <laughs> word perfect, you know. And if you memorized one verse a week, I don't think you'd get to that by the end of your lifetime. <laughs> These guys were serious about learning God's word. They were serious about understanding what the Old Testament said. If there was anybody that should have seen Jesus in the Old Testament, it should have been them. Of course, these were the guys that missed out on him more than anyone. <laughs> and what does he say? He claims, hey, you people who think you know scriptures so well, you better go back and reread them. He says, search the scriptures. He says, because in them you think that you have eternal life. You're resting in the fact that you're doing the th works of the law. You're resting in the fact that you've got your sacrifice or you've got Moses to tell you how things are going to go. He says, but you've the whole point of the law in, in its entirety. It's pointing towards a need for a Messiah. It's pointing towards the fact that you have the ability to keep the law. <laughs> you cannot, You cannot be righteous. Look at Israel's history time and time again. Jesus, uh, I mean, Moses brought them through the wilderness and they started complaining and they started, ended up, what, in problems. Had to repent, come back around. And you see this whole cycle, many, many times repeated, where they fell into sin again, tried to do the right thing. The Bible says, there is none righteous, no, not one. Apart from Christ, we have no hope. Apart from a Messiah that we, we need and which the Old Testament prophesied of, we have no ability to do the right thing. The Bible says all we like sheep have gone astray. <laughs> Everyone has turned to his own way. And isn't that true today? We tend to like to go our own way. We tend to go astray. We don't stay where we need to be. We don't stay focused on the truth that we know. And instead we go all kinds of directions. So what does Jesus say? Search the scriptures. You're going to see that they point to me. Remember they only had the Old Testament, and these prophecies of Jesus were all through the Old Testament. They testified of this Messiah which was to come, and Jesus was able to fulfill every single one. He was able to fill a law that they could not fill. He was able to offer a redemption that they could not get through sacrificing an animal or keeping some commandment. And so he says... You want to talk about who I am? My work testifies to who I am. These witnesses testify to who I am. And now I'm going to tell you something about yourselves. <laughs> about you folks that just have been accusing me. I mean, I, I, I think he may have gotten a little fired up in all this. I don't know. But, uh, you know, here, here were these people saying, Oh, Jesus, you can't be on the Sabbath. I can only just see him. Hey, guys, let me just tell you a thing or two. <laughs> You know, I, I don't know. I don't know if Jesus really treated people that way. But nonetheless, the truth had to have come, been very confrontational to them. Because after all these things that he says about himself and about why they should be believing in who he is, what does he say to them in verse 40? And you will not come to me that you might have life. Instead of coming to me, you are resisting me, you are accusing me, you are turning against me. He says, you will not come to me that you might have life. And they, were, they, were, they were wondering. He's seemingly set in stone, you know, things about Jesus that he had just told them. There was still a question. There were question marks in 
they may have been all in awe of his works, and they may have seen his witnesses as credible, but they still looked at him and said, I'm not so sure. Do I really want to put my trust in him? They were still wondering if he really was who he said, and he says, just reveals to them exactly what their hearts were thinking. <laughs> you will not come to me. This was despite the bulk of the Old Testament that pointed out their own incapability and their need for a Savior. What does he then go on to say in verse 41? I receive not honor from men. He says, you folks should be honoring me right now. <laughs> I've got all of this behind me. I should be receiving honor from men. What did he say earlier? My honor came from God the Father. The passage earlier. He says, but... Here I am, standing in front of men that should know better. You should be honoring me, but instead, you won't even come to me. They would not honor Jesus. And then this one's got to really strike home in verse 42. He says, I know you. That's got to strike home. <laughs> when someone really knows you, aren't we a little afraid of that? You know, I don't care how close of a friend you have or how, how close of a relationship you have. There's always things that you don't want somebody to know about you, right? <laughs> There's always something on the inside that, hey, I'm just going to keep this one locked away. <laughs> no one really needs to, to know. Sometimes we, we know even your spouse may not know things. And you know, you say, I, I, I'm, I'm just not comfortable being that exposed, being that vulnerable to who I am. But what does he say clearly? I know you. I know everything about you. You think you're hiding those things away about who I am and what you believe? You're not. <laughs> you're completely exposed before me. He says, I know you. And what does he say? You do not have the love of God in you. <laughs> These were people who claimed to be loving God by preventing people from working on the Sabbath. This was what their claim was. We are loving God. We are, we, are, we are against Jesus because we love God. This was their claim, right? This was what they were all about. I'm loving God by doing these things. What does he say? I know your hearts. You don't have the love of God in you. You don't love God at all. Very confrontational. Verse 43. He says, I'm come in my Father's name, and you receive me not. But if another shall come in his own name, ye will receive. These people were looking for someone else to be their Messiah. Really anyone else. They were looking for someone who'd come in that would be popular, prestigious, polished, somebody who really had his act together, somebody who wasn't, you know, wondering at night where he was going to lay his head, someone who didn't just wander around. that he was with. Yes, these were, these were the high ups. These were the Pharisees. These were the people who really, they had their act together. They were respected by others. And when Jesus came, when this Messiah, he was going to have his act together too. He was going to have on the three-piece suit. He was going to have the dignitaries behind him. He was going to have all this. And this wasn't the guy. He says, you're waiting to give honor to somebody else and you should be giving honor to me. And verse 44, he says, How can you believe which receive honor one of another, and you seek not the honor that cometh from God only? These people were too busy honoring and seeking acknowledgement from their peers to be truly seeking the Lord in their life. How often do we get wrapped up into that same mindset? <laughs> I'm looking for an acknowledgement. I'm looking for a little you know, a little boost. A little, my ego's getting a little low, feeling a little down. I'm trying to get... You know, trying to get some support, recognitions, and you know what? We're happy to give that too. You know, give you you get I'll, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours, right? <laughs> we'll give you an award, and you get an award. You know, today that's the thing, right? Everybody's a winner. You know, there's no losers. Everybody gets the uh, participation trophy or whatever it is. <laughs> the Jews of Jesus' day, we think this is a new thing. This was all about the way the Jews were in that day. They were all about, everybody got a trophy in the, in the Sanhedrin. Everybody in the Pharisees got one. Oh, you're a great day. Wonderful prayer out there this morning, brother. Let's give you a little uh, reward. Hey, sir, I'm really glad to see what you did to the poor today. You are a wonderful example of 
God the Father today, and there was a lot of this. And, you know, we get caught in those same traps where it's all about I'm trying to impress the other, I'm trying to get honor from each other, and we're so busy looking for that honor from each other. What does Jesus say? You forgot to look for the honor that comes from God. (laughs) You forgot to seek the Lord in these things. And so what does he say, the conclusion of it all? Verse 45, don't think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. He says, I don't need to go tell the Father what you're all about. (laughs) He says, because the very one that you're trusting in, the words that he's written in the Old Testament, they are going to reveal exactly what it is that you're all about. The very law in which they were trusting would be the first witness to accuse them of their guiltiness before God and their need of a Savior. And so he says, don't wonder. Recognize me for who I am. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. These are the the truths that Jesus wanted them to understand. Don't let it just be a religion. Don't let it just be a lifestyle. Don't let it just be a culture for you. And you know, I think if there's anything that this whole pandemic thing's taught us, it's taught us that maybe for ourselves, really how committed am I to the Lord? You know, when I can't get out to meet, when we're limited to how many services that we can have, when we have only can maybe watch on television, you know, did I really get turned that on on time? Did I, I, I wait till halfway through. That beginning part's kind of dumb anyway. We'll move to the, the good stuff. <laughs> or maybe we just start at the beginning for the music and then turn off the bad stuff at the end, right? <laughs> like that long-winded guy that keeps talking, you know? <laughs> Our hearts are revealed with how much we seek the Lord through these times, right? And they should be revealing something about ourselves to ourselves. Because the Lord should be really what we seek after and desire and love. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. That is what the Bible, that Jesus says is the first and the greatest commandment. It's still there for us today. Is he your first love? Is he what you're seeking after? Have you recognized his work? events that have happened in your life that continue to acknowledge and continue to confirm for you that yes, there really is a God. Yes, he really is still at work today. The Bible, we're not singing this song, but I I love it because it's this. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living no matter what they say. Why do we know that? Because if you're a Christian and you're following after the Lord, Things are all going to be, you know, peaches and cream the rest of you. But the fact of the matter is, during those dark days, you will have someone to cling to. And you will find time after time that He will in your life. And He will meet those needs. And He is always good. So, let's have a word of prayer as we close this morning. Lord, we, we acknowledge the fact that sometimes we are like these Jews even. Lord, maybe there's sometimes we stand before you and think that we have the right to judge whether or not we wish to follow you, whether or not this is something we really want to do, whether it's our preference. Lord, may we not fall victim to that type of thinking. May we be exposed in our own lives as to our true love of you. Lord, if there's someone here this morning that doesn't know you as their Lord and Savior, if they don't have that foundation in their life, if they're not sure that they have eternal life, Lord, I pray that today they might speak to me or someone here. and We can show them very clearly and quickly how they can trust in you as their Savior. And Lord, for those of us that maybe have trusted in you for many years, Lord, that doesn't mean that we still have the love for you that we should. I pray that you would help us to truly recognize who it is that you are. And may we recognize you are the judge of things, that we will be revealed before you. And Lord, may we 
be at work even in this lifetime to be weeding out those things that wouldn't be pleasing to you. And we thank you for that opportunity. We thank you for your long suffering. And we thank you for your many blessings in our life. In Jesus' name, amen.